Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our listeners. I am uh, Hani Bakker, um, Medair Security Director for Aviation and Maritime, which is an international SOS company. I am truly honored to be accompanied today by a prominent figure in the aviation industry, a global leader leading the Arab Air Carriers Organization, or also known as ACO. ACO was established in 1965 within the framework of the Arab League of States. It is the regional association representing 33 Arab airlines and its headquartered is in Beirut, Lebanon. ACO represents and defends the common interests of its members regionally and globally through creating joint frameworks that aims at developing economic and safe operations for its members. My guest today is uh, Mr. Abdul Wahab Tufaha. After his postgraduate studies in socioeconomic development and political sociology, Mr. Tafaha joined ACO as an assistant tariff analyst and rose up the ranks until becoming assistant secretary general back in 1992. He was then elected as the secretary general of the association in 1996 and still serves in this capacity until now. It's no secret that Mr. Tafaha played a key role in developing a new strategy for ACO based on delivering specific, measurable, attainable, relevant and time-bound results for all of the ACO member airlines. Some of the joint projects between ACO members were quickly launched under his leadership and those included to date a uh, projects that deal with distribution agreements, ground handling, fuel training and MRO and other projects. Mr. Tafaha also leads ACO in all global industry related issues. As you'd appreciate, there hasn't been a greater time for the voice of reason to speak for the interest of the aviation industry. Mr. Tafaha, welcome, and thank you so much for joining me today. Um, perhaps if I start with some of the key interests uh, of questions that are of, uh, of interest for the aviation industry and certainly for the traveling public, given the current crisis that we are going through today. So if I may ask by perhaps looking at the uh, the, as you'll appreciate clearly with COVID-19, the aviation industry is going through some severe turbulence that requires everyone to disconnect the autopilot, take back control of the situation and certainly bring the industry back to safety. In the past, as you'll recall, the, uh, the industry has proven resilience to crisis and outbreaks such as the global financial crisis back in 2008 and some of the global uh, pandemics and, and endemics as well, such as SARS of 2003, 9-11 attacks of 2001 and the avian flu and MERS of 2005. Now, Mr. Tafaha, from your perspective, at what point did you feel the crisis was taking the industry to a nosedive and how did ACO approach the situation? I don't think anyone even imagined that we would reach a situation where 90% of the flights uh, in the world would be grounded. As we remember, the situation of the corona, the identification of a new strain of, uh, of coronavirus happened early in this year. By uh, late January, it became evident that in China they have a problem. Uh, in mid-February, I remember I was preparing a presentation that I uh, delivered in, actually in India. Uh, in that presentation, I changed it at the last minute and uh, put a slide in it uh, saying, uh, you know, we have a serious problem now, an endemic in, in China. Hopefully it will not become a pandemic, uh, but an endemic which is strong enough that may affect the aviation in this year. And I, I prepared a presentation showing the impact of SARS, uh, trying to learn from previous uh, crises. Uh, and the possible impact of COVID. Of course, I was nowhere near the reality of what happened with COVID-19. Uh, by by mid-March, we realized in ACO that it's becoming really a global issue, a serious issue uh, that would require certain activities at a level that we have not seen before. And we identified as end of March uh, through uh, our connections with IATA, ICAO, uh, the Arab Civil Aviation Organization, and with the member airlines, of course, through our reports which we have prepared and circulated to them, that although we are facing, uh, you know, uh, something that we have never faced before, and we need to start thinking of 
when we come back and how we come back and what are the issues uh, that we need to address when we come back. Because although COVID-19 is unprecedented, ultimately, not only the industry, the whole world, the, the, the fact that it, it is in our DNA that we are a social species, uh, we will go back to travel, we will go back to meet physically with uh, not, not over the, the, uh, uh, the virtual world. Uh, we, we will go back, but going back is, is going to be uh, difficult, uh, needs very, very, uh, uh, very uh, uh, detailed planning. Uh, how do we address it? How do we secure our industry and the traveling public from being exposed uh, to, to the virus? For ACU, uh, it was uh, uh, trying to uh, identify things on the strategic level because we knew that airlines were really drowning under the pressure of the of the day-to-day -day, uh, dealing with that uh, with this crisis great well thank you so much for this insight mr tafaha so there were certainly some expectations there but not as as you noted not at the magnitude that we are uh, that we're seeing today perhaps if we look at some of the of of the airlines and actions that are taken by various airlines and airports uh, and the mitigating measures and the risk mitigations those vary uh, significantly from collecting passengers' health data before travel, from physical distancing on board an aircraft and, 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 and at airports, from requesting passengers and, and crew to wear protective gear, to even the extent that some of the ACO members and, and other airlines are requiring crew to fall to wear a complete full head to toe protective gear. So this varies significantly, amongst other mitigating measures. Now, what do you think the new norm would look like from, from your perspective? And, and, and looking at a crystal ball, how long do you think this is going to last for? The new norm is not what we are seeing today. There will be two phases in, in, the, recovery, uh, in the recovery process that the world is going to witness in the travel and tourism industry. The first phase is going to be just like, you know, a, a top, an infant uh, learning how to walk. Uh, the infants will know how to walk, but they will try, they will walk, they will fall, they will stand up again, and so on. What we are seeing today is each government, because it's not the airlines who decide uh, what to do in terms of immunization of their ecosystem from the from the exposure. It's the governments who decide, health ministries, civil aviation uh, authorities, and so on. So now. It is all about uh, trying to immunize that system uh, and mitigate the exposure to the maximum uh, extent possible. And herein, there is a problem. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, when ACO started thinking of, uh, okay, fine, we know we are in, the, in a crisis, but we need to think of after the crisis. How do we restart? How do we recover? from uh, the deep pit we are, we are in today. Uh, one of the major conditions of recovery, of going back to normal uh, and to create or to go back to the norm of travel, norm of normal travel, uh, is to uh, uh, actually uh, project trust and confidence in the, in the traveling public. Number one, the travelers need to trust the system so that they come back. Uh, in order to trust the system at the beginning of this phase, which is not going to be the normal, uh, and I hope it's not going to go for a long time, we need to ensure that we are projecting the maximum safety level to, these, uh, to the travelers. And therefore, Governments are deciding that, uh, you know, uh, airlines, airports would need to have uh, at the airport social distancing. Uh, airlines would need to have the crew wearing uh, full PPEs, uh, even hazmat sometimes, uh, masks, passengers wearing masks, and so on and so forth. These are meant to uh, instill confidence in the system that if you travel, 
it's not uh, going to increase your exposure to the uh, to the threat of the virus. Now, it is very important that after this baby steps and going back to normal life, we need to start doing the right thing, which is as we have actually advocated, and now it is it is actually it is the global norm that we need harmony in these measures. We need uh, credibility uh, in the institutions that are giving us the guidelines of how to, to process uh, passengers, of how to process, uh, how to do the processes on board and, and uh, on the ground. And this is why ACO was instrumental in, in uh, uh, working with the regional uh, uh, organizations, IATA, ICAO, and ACAO, plus in ICAO uh, and its work with what is called CARP, uh, which is a special uh, committee that was uh, established by uh, the Council of ICAO that actually included the World Health Organization, IATA, the regional organizations in uh, civil aviation. The, pur the purpose is to create harmony in these measures that are meant to instill confidence in the system. Now let me let me sidetrack a little bit from uh, from this point because I believe this is the most important point in, in, in uh, our conversation today. Uh, how to go back to normal and what is normal in the future? Uh, going back to normal needs to number one instill trust. Number two, not to have confusion and different measures uh, so that people will understand that when dealing with, with uh, air travel, you are dealing with the globe. You are not dealing with a hotel or you are not dealing with a restaurant in a fixed place. You are dealing with something that moves around the world and different uh, under different regulatory systems. Therefore, we need harmony. We need that in order to instill uh, trust. And one more thing, the, air, the the actual air transport, the aircraft itself, is actually the strongest link in this, because the way the filtering is done, the way the uh, pressure is done in the, uh, from, uh, from top to down, that will minimize the effect of, of uh, contagion, and of course with the mask and so on. Now, is this the new norm? No, it's not. The new norm is going, I believe, is going to uh, start appearing uh, by the end of this year, uh, whereby we will continue to see some aspects of social distancing at airports, uh, some uh, uh, management of capacity in a way that uh, we apply social distancing on aircraft if the capacity and load permits. Uh, and the, the most important thing is to use technology to its maximum so that we have minimum touch points uh, physical touch points between passengers and whatever surfaces they are dealing with or people uh, so that the system is immunized uh, from the threat and we move back to uh, to the normal which is going to be the normal of 2019 hopefully not later than uh, mid 2021. Well, thank you, Mr. Tafaha. That's a great insight. So, immunization of the aviation ecosystem is really what we what we're looking at here in order to uh, to bring it back to normal. I'm fully supportive. I, I think I think you, you you echo the voices of various global leaders that have great interest and the aviation industry at at their heart of the instilling consumers' trust, in, instilling the traveling public's trust in order to bring it back to normal trying to shed some light into the wrong perception that many people have about actually about the safety on board an aircraft and actually look as, as, as you rightly put it, the HEPA systems and all the different measures that a modern aircraft fleet certainly uh, possess and have. So um, thank you for that. Now, as you're aware, various aviation uh, uh, government bodies are providing guidance on the handling of the pandemic, advising airlines and airports on best practice and, and to stay safe. Now, what is ACO in specifically doing to support its 33 member airlines? Are you in particular, if I may ask, collaborating with any other government bodies or other aviation agencies to support the uh, the ACO members? We are 
cooperating 100% with ICAO, IATA, the Arab Civil Aviation Organization, and we believe that ACO or any regional body or even international association or regional association for that matter uh, should not start issuing guidelines uh, on their own. Uh, the CART, this committee, which was multidisciplinary, multi-organizational, uh, uh, actually delivered an excellent document, and that document describes all the phases of air transport. That document uh, uh, has actually detailed uh, description of what to do, how to do it, how to manage uh, uh, you know, uh, flow of people, how to manage at the airport, what to do with the crew, and so on and so forth. We stand behind this document. We stand behind those guidelines. We, we have said it so many times. We do not believe that the, uh, uh, you know, just issuing guidelines for the sake of good image is the right thing to do. Uh, anybody can do guidelines. We, uh, we did some summary of the guidelines and we said, these are not our guidelines, these are summaries of guidelines which exist there that are based on uh, the work of God. Uh, ACO, of course, contributed in, these, in the formulation of these guidelines, which were, at the end of the day, uh, were part of the of the CART uh, document, which is called Takeoff. Uh, we stand 100% behind it. Uh, we will not promote any other guideline. Uh, what is, uh, at the end of the day, very important is for the governments, who are actually the custodian of, of whatever measures, and the ones who would regulate at the end of the day, uh, to put these guidelines into practice. Uh, it's not ICAO that puts these guidelines into practice. It's not ACO, it's not any other organization. It is the national government uh, responsibility to put guidelines into practice. We hope that ultimately the governments of the world will adopt these guidelines at the standard because having a standard and, and having the, the uh, security for the airlines to know they are, that they are working in an environment which is standardized, uh, not having to deal with different regulations depending on where the aircraft is going or where the aircraft is landing. Uh, this is very important in order to uh, reinvigorate the air transport industry. Uh, as I said, and, and, and I, I can't repeat that enough, having different parties, each one uh, issuing guidelines, and issuing best practices and what have you is not going to uh, help uh, the governments in uh, developing the best guidelines depending on their national situation. Uh, we have to rely on the credibility of the work that was done by ICAO, WHO, I, uh, uh, IATA, uh, uh, regional uh, aviation organizations and others in order to say, we have already a set of guidelines, let us transpose that into national regulations so that we can have a global system that is in, her, in harmony. Yeah, very clear, Mr. Tafaha. So the key, the key message here is that ACO is uh, supportive of the work that was just done by ICAO, the guidelines they issued, the outcome and the result of the CART, report and the takeoff guidance material that was issued for, for airlines are you optimistic that those would be uh, adopted by, by by national civil aviation authorities globally now no now to tell you the truth i'm not because you know unfortunately anything anything that happens around the world becomes partly political we all saw what happened in, in Europe recently, where the UK said, fine, I will open my, my uh, airports, I will receive passengers, but they need to be quarantined for 14 days, which is a killer for aviation. Nobody will travel and be and, uh, on, the, on the premise that they will be quarantined for 14 days. What happened is France said, okay, anybody coming from the UK will be quarantined for 14 days. Now, 
I'm not trying to judge whether this is right or wrong. What I'm saying is you cannot apply that based on reciprocity. Number one, quarantine is useless. Although more than 150 countries now are applying quarantine on arriving passengers, maybe this is something that will, you know, give a little bit of a sense of safety. But on arrival, quarantine, come on. On arrival, already the passenger, if, if you have somebody who is, who is infected, already arrived, already mingled with people at the airport, already used public transport, already went to a hotel or, or whatever, uh, so already exposed to 100 people, other people for uh, to the virus. The immunization starts before the travel. And this is the whole foundation of the cart, that it is upstream protection. It is not downstream protection. Upstream starts in the planning phase of, of the travel. When the passenger uh, plans the travel, he need to make sure he or she needs to make sure that they don't have symptoms because if they are symptomatic, they shouldn't travel for any reason. And if they are symptomatic, they will be you know at the airport of departure dealt with, not at the airport of arrival. So I'm not very optimistic that governments are going to be uh, are going to implement measures that correspond to the level of threat. At the beginning, there will be, uh, like, uh, everybody will try to raise uh, uh, the others to, to say that I'm implementing the most trend, stringent measure, measures in order to secure my population against this virus. Later on, reason will, 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 will come back to mind. Pressure will be coming from economic activities that would not like the, I mean, hotels, cars or tourism is is going to be dead if you apply uh, quarantine. So these people who work this uh, domain of supporting uh, tourism and travel, uh, the people who work there will start putting pressure on the governments. Come on, if a country does not have a risk, like for instance, New Zealand, they didn't have any infection, any case for the last 15 days, which means that they are free of COVID. Why would you put any restrictions on people coming from New Zealand to your to your country? This is one one example. I believe you know in the next couple of months, three months maybe, we will see, we will see some draconian measures because it's it's really public image. But then reason will settle. Then people are going to uh, regulators will go back to looking at the at the importance and added value uh, in reinvigorating this uh, aviation uh, travel and tourism and therefore uh, applying these guidelines the way they were meant to to, to be applied which is uh, uh, regulate guidelines or, or uh, processes that are corresponding to a level of threat not processes that are fit uh, uh, fit for all uh, they need to be uh, processes applied based on the level of threat that is uh, coming from which country and uh, uh, or which airport. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Faha. So the response needs to be commensurate to the threat rather than just Absolutely. a one size fits all and a list of mitigating measures that just slows down the recovery of the of, of the industry. Um, yeah, thank you for that insight, Mr. Tafaha. Clearly, uh, as, as you've seen, as you're aware, as we've discussed over the past 20 minutes or so, it is the greatest challenge ever experienced, perhaps, over the, the past 100 years, right? And certainly aviation industry is not Im immune from that. Now, what has been, throughout the past five or six months or so, what has been the greatest challenge for ACU members? And, and how could this be overcome? I believe it's not only for our members, it's for everyone. All the airlines of the world, in fact, maybe all the businesses in the world. The greatest challenge was managing liquidity because the revenue stopped streaming in. And, but your obligations as a business, 
airline or otherwise. Airline, of course, you know, they have a very high exposure to uh, intense uh, cash outlay. Uh, your your uh, obligations did not stop. Uh, so the biggest crisis, the biggest problem or challenge that the airlines have faced is in the area of how do I manage my cash in a way that will ensure two things: the continuation of the of the human capital that I have. I have trained over the years. I don't want to lose that capital uh, unless I am really I'm you know my back is to the wall. And the second thing, to ensure that uh, my brand, my my uh, image, is uh, is intact uh, coming out from this uh, pandemic, so that when when time is ripe for me to come back, I will be back, uh, you know, communicating with the passengers, with the with the uh, with the travelers, saying that I am somebody who can uh, with whom you can you can put your confidence in so that was the the biggest challenge now of course many governments have uh, actually agreed on uh, providing support stimuli uh, packages and so on to to uh, not only to airlines for other businesses uh, but the, the problem of the airlines is that uh, as you know uh, it's like again, like building the hotel. You build 500 rooms on the on the basis that you will occupy these 500 rooms at least 80 percent uh, occupancy at least for six months uh, of the year, and then you put the prices that will give you good return on investment. The problem with the uh, with the airplane is that this is done on every single flight. It's not that you have uh, uh, real estate and uh, you can plan it based on the season and so on uh, to have 500 600 rooms full out of 1000 the airplane is is a different asset uh, it's deployed differently and uh, and the the way the capacity is uh, you know they managed uh, it's managed differently uh, one of the problems that the airlines will be facing is that the recovery period uh, is expected to last between three to six years. Three years if uh, best case scenario, if the governments apply harmonious measures, uh, if the economies uh, do not uh, go into deep recession, if trade disputes do not flare, if, uh, you know, there are many ifs which are all, uh, you know, trying to say that you know, the positive things would happen, not the negative things. We would need at least, in case of the best case scenario, we would need at least up till 2023 to, to go back to 2019 level. In case things not go in the right direction, I believe it will take maybe up to six, seven years maybe to recover. Now, during that period, it's how do airlines manage capacity? This is the biggest the challenge that they will be facing starting from the day they will restart operations because you already have aircraft on the basis of a certain plan you already have over capacity on what is the market today and what probably the market will be during the next two three years at least so this is really going to be a big challenge for the airlines of the world how do you manage capacity in a way that will keep you, you know, meeting your obligations, keep your ends meet, and actually be able to provide you with the flexibility uh, to uh, uh, actually incentivize the market to come back quicker than than later. Yeah, thank you. I think a lot of a lot of great points here, and I think it will be of, of great benefit to uh, to our listeners. And viewers, uh, Mr. Tufaha, we are uh, well. We're coming to the end of the of our time here, but we're truly grateful for your insights. You've made a lot of very interesting points. Uh, three to six years potential recovery from the industry. We're truly hopeful for as for for to see a recovery uh, as as quickly as possible for the interest of the industry and the traveling population, and then for and for the average citizen that that, that travels brand reputation and brand protection, consumers' confidence to bring the industry back, 
preservation of human capital and the training and the experienced personnel that is uh, is not easy to, to to bring those back and retrain and retain etc cash flow that you've you, you, you've uh, you've you've touched upon you've talked about quarantine measures in countries and you mentioned over 150 countries have got uh, have got some form of a quarantine requirement and clearly this reflects and has correlation upon the um the progression and the aspiration, the recovery aspiration of the uh, of the industry, and certainly the capacity. Uh, Mr. Tufahav, well, thank you so much for, uh, for for your time today. I think it's been a very useful insight, and uh, and we're truly looking forward to talking to you again, not in the too distant future, to see how things are progressing, and uh, and hopefully to hear some positive stories as borders start to open up at the end of the at the end of the month and and into July. And uh, yes, yeah, so. Um, Thank you once again, Mr. Tufaha, and, and hopefully we speak to you again soon. Thank you very much. Hopefully next time we will meet in person rather than this uh, over these screens. It will be, <laughs> our, it will be our, our pleasure to come and come and see you in person. Thank, Thank you, you once again. Thank and you. And All the best.